Hello, good morning, and welcome to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One and Virgin Media Player. It is Thursday, the 9th of November. It is great to have you with us. Coming up on the show, we are tackling childcare costs and getting Rick Rolled. Always, always a pleasure to Didn't be with you. know Rick what that Rolled, was, but it? I know now. He does, yeah. But first, we're going to be talking about the news from yesterday beef exports from Ireland to the Chinese market. They have been suspended after a case of atypical BSE was detected in a cow. It was during a routine test. So we'll have more on how this could affect perhaps economic relations, what it means for farmers. That's coming up at 7.50. Uh, coming up later on, we're going to speak to parents combating the rising price of childcare by sharing out their, the care of children amongst each other. It's pretty much Tinder for childcare. I think it's genius. Would you be open to let strangers look after your children? We'd love to get your opinion on this. Would you put it out there? Would you look after other people's children? Mm -hmm. How would it even work? 0896 111 We're going to be discussing that at 7.45. Uh, and also, you'll hear us saying a lot of this today. <laughs> He'll never give you up, let you down, run around, or desert you. That Love is it. right, the one and only. The king of Glastonbury this year. You've seen him a couple of times, haven't you? Love him. Rick Astley is going to be joining us for a chat after 8 o'clock. Very excited Fabulous. to get Rick Rolled. Also, what else is coming up, Al? Why didn't you sing it? We're never going to keep you, you up. up. Never going to let you down. <laughs> never going to turn around. That's it. Love it. Now, we're going to be talking... Can I, come, taking... can I join the panto? <laughs> you can. Oh, You're hired. <laughs> Uh, we'll be taking a look at Dublin's top tourist attractions as we approach the winter season. Plus, there's cheesecake in the kitchen and we're going to be tasting some best European wines. So we're really indulging ourselves this morning. Mm. Sure, it's nearly the weekend. We're allowed. This week on Ireland AM, we've teamed up with Visit Armagh to give you the chance to win an amazing prize for two people of a two-night B&B stay. With one evening meal at Littlewood Bank, tickets to the world's only Game of Thrones studio tour, £100 shopping voucher for the Boulevard, £50 meal voucher at the Salt Kitchen, and a trekking experience at Mourn Alpacas. Autumn and winter is a great time to visit Armagh. You can explore the hidden gems of Armagh, enjoy open spaces and historic houses at National Trust Properties, and shop until you drop at the Boulevard Premium Shopping Outlet. You can also celebrate the beginning of the Christmas season at the award-winning Armagh Georgian Festival taking place 23rd to the 26th of November. See visitarmagh.com to create your perfect autumn winter mini break. For your chance to win this great prize, just answer this question. What province is Armagh in? Is it A, Ulster or B, Leinster? To enter, just call 1550 999 092 or text VISIT to 57199. Best of luck. Now it's time to take a look at this morning's papers. They are dominated by one story. We'll start with the Irish Times and its headline, Judge queries accounts of Molly Martins and father before sending them to prison. Molly Martins and her father, Thomas, have been sentenced to serve between seven months and two and a half years in prison over the killing of Limerick man Jason Corbett in August 2015. Don't be fooled by Molly's mask. A monster lurks beneath. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The children of Jason Corbett courageously delivered their victim impact statements in person. Jack and Sarah Corbett described Molly Martins as a monster who had taught them to lie and who had weaponized their words in a bid to avoid responsibility. Similarly, the examiner says a monster is lurking underneath the exterior. Jack Corbett also told Judge Hall he suffered with panic attacks and fear since his father's death. The Daily Mail goes with Monster Molly is sent back to prison. Molly Martins was yesterday placed on suicide watch with full psychiatric evaluation on her to be carried out. The Mirror, The Sun, The Star and The Herald all unsurprisingly lead with that same story. And we'll be talking more about that in just a little while. Uh, but coming up, uh, news of a case of atypical BSE in a cow, which is different from mad cow disease, has halted Irish beef exports to China, which will come as a blow to the government, because Micheál Martin, of course, is over there at the minute uh, as it tries to gain a greater foothold on the world's largest importer Me of beef. there to save the day. Of course he is. <laughs> We're going to be discussing that after the break.
Welcome back. Now, you will have heard that a lot of cows, Irish beef exports to China, have been indefinitely suspended following detection, the detection of a case of atypical BSE last week in one 10-year-old cow. So joining us now to discuss the effect this could have on Irish farmers is chairman of the IFA National Livestock Committee, Brendan Golden, on Skype alongside rural affairs journalist with the Irish Independent, Niall Hurston. Good morning to you both. Um, Niall, let's go to you first of all. Give us a rundown on this. So it's an atypical type of BSE. What's the difference between that and, say, the mad cow disease or kind of classic BSE, which we would have seen back in, say, the 90s? Yeah, so look, they're, they're different. That was from feed contamination, whereas a typical BSE uh, is spontaneous. It occurs in all populations of beef cattle, um, or now all cattle around the world. But does um, it, what sort of impact would it have on on the animal itself. On the animal itself and people who would be consuming it. So atypical would have no impact on the people consuming it, but okay. uh, on the it's animal... It's not contagious. It's not contagious, yeah. which is important to say. Um, on the animal itself, it can go unnoticed. Like cl Clinical signs of it uh, would be um, a, a, a discoordination because it's a neurological uh, disease. Mm. Um, and the way it's discovered is uh, under a microscope, it's spongy form. Uh, so the brain goes spongy with the, the hollows in it. Um, and also they can detect the prions, which is the misfolded proteins uh, within the brain, which... But it's not as dangerous or, or as worrying as what we saw back when mad cow disease was huge and there was like a complete shutdown in the beef industry. No, uh, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, that, that was feed contamination. It was mm -hmm. actually meat bone meal products being fed to, to livestock that... Uh, created this, this clinical BSC, which led to human health impacts. Yeah, again, like this happens. They find this all the time. The fact is, is that Michal Martin, of course, is in China. And if we can just bring Brendan in here, it was just in January this year that beef exports, that we started exporting cows back to China again after a three-year suspension, uh, because, of course, they are very wary of food scandals in that country. Um, so, Brendan, is this going to impact farmers hugely since we didn't have this market for a long time anyway? I suppose at the moment and with the timing of it, it's not hugely significant from the point of view of affecting farmers because the amounts we have put in there this year are very small. I think we're in the region of 2,700 tonnes, which is really minuscule in the context of what we produce and what we export out of the country. It is very disappointing news from the point of view that it's an emerging market and was a market that has huge potential. And we always... We appreciate, you know, every new market we can get into that they have the potential to add value to our product. So from that point of view, it was disappointing. But the key for me is that at home here at the moment with our own home markets of the UK and the EU, that we we contend that there's more scope in the marketplace for prices to rise. So uh, with it being disappointing news and then coming on the back of just a couple of days before that the Korean market was potentially opening up to us, it, you'd, you'd say it was uh, nearly like uh, good news and bad news in the in the same day for the difference. But um, <clears throat> hugely disappointing from the point of view of all the work that had gone in to get us back in there at the start of the year. I can imagine it's extremely frustrating, particularly the fact that there was a case back in 2020, as Moran mentioned, and there was that suspension. Like, will this affect the fact this has happened now a second time and China has said no now to Irish beef going in there? Like, will this have a knock-on effect in other markets around the world? No, it's separate, and I suppose they, that's a point as well. We go into 70 markets, other markets around the world. The the status we have of neg negligible risk status um, for BSE um, with uh, in those uh, all those other markets, this case does not affect that status in any way. So there's no issue whatsoever in the other markets. And it's just that, unfortunately, we have a very tight um, certificate with China for export. And under the terms of that certificate, we have to report everything to them. Mm -hmm. And it does show the strength of our surveillance and our food safety systems that this showed up at all in the first place, because that's something that a lot of farmers were saying to me and a lot of people were saying to me yesterday, why do we even have to report something like this? Because in the broad context of things, it's not a very serious thing at all. But okay. I suppose the word BSE um, raises alarm bells with everybody because we know 
we know on the other side of it with classical BSE and as you mentioned yeah. there earlier, the mad cow disease that sets off alarm bells. Of course it does and you don't want the whole industry to come crashing down around you again no. like it did in a certain case. But Niall, if we're talking about a market like China and then as Brendan just mentioned there, we're talking about going back into Korea. We know that the methane that comes out from these living, breathing creatures that are cows are hugely impacting our climate targets and what we're doing. So is this not going to have, would that not have a huge effect if we are opened up to these massive markets again? That they'll have to look at the, at the industry and go, how are you lads? We can't have this many cows in the country. Well, the argument would be that we are one of the most sustainable producers of beef here. Like China in particular, their main import is from Brazil. Uh, which has been clearly identified as uh, a deforestation nation um, to... to uh, yeah, but just obviously we know that there's issues with Brazil, but there are issues here as well that it has been pointed towards methane and what's happening with our climate targets. We've had the hottest year on record, you know, there's a lot going on. Yeah, it's less than ideal to have to sell your beef to the other side of the globe. Um, but look, Irish farmers need to, to get a, a better price for the beef they sell. Um, Chagas estimates that they should be getting six euro per kilo uh, to, to make a margin on, on the animals they sell. They, they make nowhere near that at the moment. Um, and, and look, the, we, we do it the most sustainable as, as anyone in the world. Uh, so why would we not produce it here? And, and if we didn't, we'd allow for many other countries who don't do it nearly as sustainable or as welfare driven uh, to, to supply these markets. Yeah. So how, how much will this affect the price? Like how much will this affect Irish farmers? It won't have a, a major impact on the weekly or monthly check uh, okay. that a, a farmer would receive from the factory because we export €2 billion Euro worth of beef every year and the Chinese market, when it was in full flow, was worth uh, approximately €40 million. Uh, so it's, it's a drop in the ocean, you know, compared to, to what we do export. So compared to, say, pork, pork is a massive market. Our China is a massive market for Irish pork, though, is that right? It takes Irish pork... It, it, well. China is a huge consumer of pork. I think it consumes 40% of the world's uh, supply of pork. Um, and look, that leaves gaps in other parts of the world where the Irish uh, suppliers can fill. So absolutely, um, pork, it would be a much more significant export from a China perspective. Yeah, maybe seeing some of the... We, there was a documentary earlier this year on RT, obviously, on how these animals were treated when they were being exported. You know, it, it didn't come off very well. So maybe it's OK that we're not transporting them to the other side of the world. Yeah. Well, I yeah. suppose uh, to China it would be frozen boneless beef. It, it wouldn't be a live animal would be making that journey. Uh, it's the it's just mainland Europe where we, we would be so sending them the live animals. So we send them the off to the and that's where they do it, yeah. And then yeah. they export them all out. Um, so farmers are going to be OK. It's not going to affect them hugely. No, it's a benefit to have China okay. and it adds extra uh, value to our product. It diversifies where we send our beef. So um, it is a negative thing to, to have happened to have it to close out again. But uh, on the short term, no, it won't have a okay. significant no. change to their, their income okay. impact. But yeah. uh, listen, I suppose it puts down to Ireland's good controls and testing as well, which yeah, is absolutely. a positive from an Irish point of view as well. Uh, listen, Niall Hurston from the Irish Independent, thank you so much for joining us as well this morning. And Brendan Golden, uh, Chairman of the IFA National Livestock Committee. Thank you, Brendan, for joining us on Skype as well. Again, if this impacts you at home, 0896 111 if you are a meat farmer, we'd love to hear from you. And still to come, uh, you will have heard about this, uh, data breaches. Uh, there's 8,000 people who had their data breached, we think, and to the rise of personal loans. We'll be discussing the latest stories hitting the headlines this morning. Uh, plus, we're going to hear from the mother who's cutting childcare costs through sharing care with other like-minded parents. All coming up this hour on Ireland Day. Now, there's one story all over the papers this morning, that of yesterday's decision that Thomas Martin and daughter Molly Martins were sentenced to between 51 and 74 months in prison for the killing of Jason Corbett back in 2015. Joining us that story and everything else this morning is the editor of the journal.ie, Sinead O'Carroll. Sinead, thank you so much Sinead. for joining us. Obviously, this has been quite complicated because they were sentenced previously. They appealed that uh, conviction for the murder and they put in a plea deal of second degree manslaughter just two Mondays. Ago. Yeah, so because we have been hearing um, from um, the courthouse for two weeks, it felt like a trial, but it was actually a sentencing hearing mm. because they had pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter. So we knew 
the, the outcome was going to be a sentence that wasn't going to be very long and we knew that the, what the, the time that they had spent in prison previously was going to be counted. So um, what we were told then yesterday is there's still a little bit of confusion about exactly how long they will spend, but it's a minimum of seven months. If they get all of the good behaviour that they mm. built up during their sentence initially, then it will be seven months that they will, they will spend in, in jail. It could be longer, it could be up to the two and a half years. Yeah. It's been very hard for the families of Jason Corbett and also so Max Fitzpatrick, uh, Jason's first wife, to listen to their characters being completely and utterly assassinated and they're not here to defend themselves. And even when you think of the time and Sarah and Jack, uh, Jason Corbett's uh, children, who are now 17 and 19, made that point, it's, oh, it's almost half of their lives that they have been spent in this turbulence of not only grief and loss and bereavement, but also trials and legal conundrums and just having to decide things like this week, will I have my victim statement read out or will I do yeah. it myself? And, and they both decided in the end to do it themselves and, and they read and out, they wrote them and read out such powerful statements that, you know, unbelievable that two teenagers would have to yeah. go through sure all this, of yeah. that. Um, and, you know, they, they were hoping for some justice for their dad. You know, the, the two people who are responsible are spending more time in jail. So I think there will be some mm. comfort in that. But um, we will probably hear more from the family about what they think yeah, of that and possibly seven months. And the judge ordered that uh, Molly Martin be put on psychiatric assessment and she could be a, a suicide risk. Yeah, so obviously there's a duty of care in prison systems that they have to make sure that um, prisoners are looked mm. after. So, you know, we heard a lot about Molly Martin's over the last two weeks mm. and, you know, one thing that became very clear is the the amount of lies she has told mm. during her life and um her character is not a stable yeah. character yeah. so we, we did learn we did learn that and we saw yesterday that she was sobbing and had a box of tissues out during the uh the victim impact statement and when and look at an awful lot of the corbett family when they were giving their victim impact yeah statements. so and i think you know uh, Sarah and Jack were very clear about what she had done to them, not yeah. just what she yeah. had done to, to Jason, but what she had done to them during yeah. their young lives. It's amazing. Um, Ralph Regal in the Irish Independent today uh, goes through what the judge has actually said about them and how they stretched you know, the, mm. the truth. It's very, very, very interesting. And we just, I can't imagine how hard it's been for the families of the Corbett's and the Fitzpatrick having to listen to, to all of this. And hopefully they feel that some sense of justice um, has been served for that. Uh, we're going to move on to a completely different story. This is about a data breach. What's going on here tonight? Yeah. Electric Ireland. Electric Ireland. So usually <clears throat> when we look at data breaches, I think people are used to hearing about data breaches and possible breaches of their data and they feel kind of woolly and like there's some bot somewhere in the world who, who's trying something. But that's, this is actually uh, much more specific. There, there, there is a... Um, knowledge that actually someone may have not inadvertently and not from outside of the country accessed data inappropriately um, of 8,000 8, customers um, from Electric Ireland. So Electric Ireland has written to them about the potential misuse of their personal and financial data and has told them to go back through their accounts up to uh, 2021 and make sure there's no suspicious activity yeah. that could have been fraudulent. Because bank details, um, credit card details, names, addresses, yeah, dates, obviously Electric about, Ireland all, have everything that all you the need. stuff you need. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was brilliant. Breached. That was breached, and the Guardi are involved as well. So it's it's both Guardi and data protection. So it's a, it's a bit more serious than uh, your run of the mill. Oh, the, yeah. your data may have been compromised. Mm. Um, this is a very specific case. So if you did get that letter, I would. Um, but if you have, if you are with Electric Ireland and you have not got a letter, you're you're they have, okay. They have they have said it's a small cohort yeah. of their million customers. It's yeah. eight thousand eight thousand people. Someone in the country is that what you said? So someone, someone who it was a, someone who had access through. They didn't work for. Electric Electric Ireland, but worked maybe on a contract or... Gotcha. Mm. OK, gotcha. Uh, so please do uh, mind yourself uh, now, with that one this morning. Personal loans in this country are at a record high. Yeah, so... Um the Bank of Federation of Ireland started uh, compiling this data in 2020. So I would caveat with that because obviously there was a lot happening in 2020 yeah. in which we weren't obviously spending our money or getting loans or doing home improvement. Surely 1990 for Italia 90. We all believe that's been the biggest year. <laughs> but since 2020, uh, they've been looking at what people are taking loans out for. And there has been a massive jump in the number of loans taken out for cars this year as compared to last year. So probably not as much of a COVID bounce if you look at 2020, but there was a 36% jump in uh, car loans. So that's been put down to maybe people looking for electric cars which are obviously yes. a lot more expensive mm -hmm. um or um luxury cars 
which I think people have noticed on the roads as well, a lot more of the like larger SUV type vehicles, which are also very expensive, yes. very different to yeah. the green options that are available. Other things people are spending money on are um, home improvements um, and green, green loans. So things like solar panels and retrofitting houses. So mm -hmm. these are the things that people probably assign that we have very, very uh, big employment numbers. Very, And so people can probably make these decisions that I can take out personal loans and make these improvements in my life because my financials um, are quite steady because I'm, I'm in employment and I'm not fearful of my job. So there is probably some of that happening that it's not that people need money uh, to get by. It's that they, they can okay. actually know, access finance and they can actually yeah. access credit to future proof their homes and, and, we see and a lot do things like, like that. There is a cost of living crisis, a lot of people struggling, but we still have a record 153 billion in savings. Yeah, and I think with the cost of living, I think what people are looking at with things like solar panels is, right, my electricity bill is so yeah. expensive. Yeah. How can I make my life a little bit more sustainable? And also, I think people are looking to, you know, be a bit more environmentally yeah. conscious. Yeah. So what can I do to future-proof, not just for myself, but for my kids? Thanks. Good day for the banks, isn't it? Yeah. Because the interest the... rates are so high, they're making yeah. a nice bit of money yeah. off the old personal loans. And not very much off, uh, not giving us very much not back very on, much on back those on the deposit. Yes, exactly. No, savings. they yeah. don't like to give us anything on our yeah. savings, really, do they? Um, um, so that's uh, what's going on with the banks. Always nice to know that they're doing incredibly well. <laughs> uh, now, Sinead, can you please, the internet has a new term. Gatsby. Gatsby. Beans, gas being, what is it? Yeah, so if you're dating right now, you've probably been very aware of the terms of gaslighting and ghosting and ghost lighting and breadcrumbing. And so you can look up all of those terms. The new one, gas being, um, which was coined actually a few years ago by a model from Australia who her and her friends uh, just started talking about um, how they end up putting a lot of photos of, of themselves online. And they don't do it for any other reason than to get the attention of the man in their lives that they want to get the attention. Maybe he hasn't texted so in a couple of days. So do they know he's okay? Okay, so. They, you're maybe sort of going out with them and then it might yeah, be so going, oh look let me see I'm doing this yeah, or let, let her see I'm at a party and look yeah. how gorgeous I am yeah so, so like Jay Gatsby did to Daisy Buchanan he, in the great yeah Gatsby. so the, the Gatsby reference is he threw all of these lavish parties yeah. on a Saturday night to try and get her attention across the water so it's the millennial online version of that so you know like you're not swinging from chandeliers drinking champagne which is a pity it would be much nicer if we were Charleston dancing rather than just like scrolling <laughs> through Instagram. Like, yes. Have you ever you tried know. to get somebody's attention? Yeah, but it, not in a very lavish way. I changed the way I used to walk home from work because... <laughs> to pass someone's to house. To pass his house. Oh, this is the, one of the most shameful periods of my life. Oh, oh my I God. think we've all done something ha yeah, We similar. have. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of my girlfriends about this and they're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I, go, I started shopping in a different supermarket because that's where he shopped. I used to, when Carl used to work in Eastern Advertising on, in Abbey Street and his desk was out a window, I used to walk down Abbey Street and wave up. And wave up. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done that? Have you done that to change your behaviour to get someone's attention? And I've away never walked down I was going to say, when is the last time you walked down Abbey Street? I'd walk around Abbey Street, walk down, and he'd look out. And I'd stand across until he looked out. You'd stand... OK, oh, that's yeah. called something else. Um, <laughs> you can let us know if you've ever done that to get someone's attention. 0896 111 The editor of the journal. Sinead Thank, Thank you, you so, much so much for being with us. Cheers. Uh, coming up, we're talking to parents uh, taking pocket-friendly measures to tackle childcare costs. See you in a few minutes. You're very welcome back. Now, there is a saying, of course, we all know it. It takes a village to raise a child. And a new childcare concept is adapting to that very mentality. It's called Care Shared, and it has brought, well, it's hoping to bring like-minded parents together. And we are joined by one of the co-founders, Sue Redmond. Sue, good morning to you. Hey, Thank Sue. you so much for joining us. Tell me what Care Shared exactly is. So Care Shared is uh, the idea of connecting families so that they could reciprocate or exchange childcare. So really, say we would identify families that are in the same locality with approximately the same age of children, and then they would meet each other and exchange a bit of childcare. So I would take your kids, for example, for a couple of hours, and you might take mine then for a few hours. And we'd, we'd first of all establish, do we even like each other? Do we get on? Just like you would if you were hiring a babysitter or a childminder, um, you'd assess, assess whether this is a comfortable experience for you and whether they're the kind of people you want to have in your lives. And then you decide, OK, we'll have a few play dates and see, do we actually like each other? And then begin the process of exchanging a bit of childcare. OK, so it's kind of like play dates, like you said there, but with strangers. Or, or, 
like, well, you get to know them a little bit, but eventually the way this will grow, it, it, it could be just with strangers. And I suppose when we talk about the cost of childcare mm -hmm. for people, and if you're trying to get back out to work, if your family aren't in the local area, this could be a great option. But what are the main concerns that people have around it? So, like, obviously there's a trust element. When you meet somebody just straight off the bat, you're not necessarily going to want to give them your most prized possession, your gorgeous children. So there is that little bit of building up a, a sense of a relationship. And that's why we encourage people to meet, connect, and go on a few play dates and see, do we actually even like each other? Do we share the same values? Are there particular needs that your child have that maybe my child doesn't have? And we encourage them to establish a family charter. Mm. And we're looking at becoming a guard of vetting or organization so that then that enables a little bit more trust and we have other a platform for online learning around um, uh, child safeguarding and then having age appropriate activities that you'd be able to engage with when you have those lovely children in your uh -huh. care for some time. So obviously there is no exchange, this is a barter system, there is no exchange of money. I mind your kids, you mind mine, we try to get a timetable that works for us. But as you mentioned there, it's not guard, guard the vetted, you don't know something about the people. And one of the reasons that childcare costs is so expensive is because of insurance. Is there an issue with insurance? Do you, are you insured? What's the story? So, so us as an organisation, we wouldn't be able to take on the liability for the behaviours of the people that sign up. We're a bit like a notice board, shall you say, for establishing, oh, there's people in the area that are open to a bit of childcare or babysitting. It would then come down to the families to establish, you know, do I need to do reference checks? Um, a lot of people who are homeowners, their public liability insurance would actually cover if there was an accident. But then if you look at, we have GP cards for under eight. So if there was an, an issue that was a non-accident related, yeah. there's, you know, it's covered. And then children in school, they have um, child, uh, child insurance or student mm -hmm. insurance. Yeah. So all of those things, like, I think we've become a bit of a litigating uh, society, which means that we have a fear of stepping forward and going, actually, can I help somebody? Actually, it's really about promoting help-seeking behaviour and being able to give. There's great sense of just feeling good in yourself when you help somebody out and then actually knowing you're going to get a little break as well. So for me, I get to surf and then for others of the girls that I swap with, they get to work. Um, I also get to work when my children have been cared. So yeah. it's a lovely way of building up a practical support around you. And of course, there's always going to be the reason not to do it. But there are a million more yeah. reasons to do it. Like, because the saying is, it takes a village to raise a child, mm. which we just mentioned. But I think those days are gone. Like, we don't have that anymore. Mm. I think something like this in years gone by would have been so popular. But people do have trust issues and... Like, from your point of view, like, do you set out boundaries and rules with the other parents? And how does that go down, like, yeah. if, the, if the kid doesn't really stick to it? So we were, we'd establish a family charter with the, the families so that they would outline, you know, safe and appropriate childcare during the time, appropriate supervision, the different things that need to happen, and then things that they were not going to do, like they're not going to shout and hit and all those other things that you just wouldn't do. Mm. So establishing that. Um, but obviously you're going to have children that, you know, sharing is a really tricky thing for... Let's be honest, adults can't share. It's part of the reason we have wars in the world. Uh, so expecting two two-year-olds to share is, you know, we, we have to work on that. But the interesting thing is, the more they bench press against that in their own homes, the more they're able for it then in broader society. Mm. So I actually think it builds up their social and emotional intelligence much more so than maybe just being on their own where they've yeah, got everything. Yeah, absolutely. I genuinely think this is such a good idea, but it involves a bit of cop on from adults. That's the thing, to be like, if your child falls and scrapes their knee, it's not that big a deal. You need yeah. them not to, like that's kind of the yeah. thing, isn't it going, lads, yeah. they're gonna be okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Cause if it works, cause eventually over time, if you're in a certain area, like you're in Lynch, surely now you know an awful lot of people and you do have a trust. Yeah. Is that, is that the way it kind of works? Yeah, well, so initially um, when myself and, and Susie Malloy, we started, um, we just knew each other from meeting at the, the preschool and then, um, we went on at one play date and we were like, this parenting lark is really hard. Yeah. You're finding it really hard. I'm finding it tough at times. And like, neither of us had family support around us. So it was like, will we be each other's family support? Great. And it was like, just let's, what about next week? 
test Tuesday for you yeah. and just straight away go for it. Listen, it's brilliant. I know exactly how you feel like it is. It is so mm. difficult and to try and find people that support who, who are able to do that as well. Like, what's the future for it? Like, it's the, you have a website, uh, careshare.org. Like, will you set up an app? Will it could be like a, a Tinder for childcare. Like, you, you, you swipe. He just wants a chance like, to swipe. To, yeah, exactly. I never it. got to do it. I know, this could be my, this could be me. <laughs> you. So, I like the look of that dad. Yeah, exactly. It'll be great. A, a little bit like that. So I was going more with Airbnb or okay, home exchange, sorry. just you know, to, to keep it PC. <laughs> right, uh, ratings, yeah. okay. So hopefully to build out an app like that. So you'd be able to see in your locality who would be open to exchanging childcare. And so if you imagine, um, like people move around. So if you ever moved, you'd be able to link in with people um, and then build up that sense of connection with yeah. people around you. So People do it. People still swap homes for holidays. What do you make of this? Your local area kind of going, OK, you're a stranger, but let's get to know each other. And will you mind my kids and I'll mind yours? 0896 111 We would love to hear from you if you've tried it or, or what you think of it. Uh, Sue Redmond uh, from careshare.org is where you can find out more. Thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Lovely Thanks to meet you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, now, still to come, uh, Rick Astley. He's going to join us to talk new releases, career reflections and maybe a bit of Rick Rowling. Yeah, plus we'll have the top picks on what to do on a day out should you be going to Dublin. We'll talk to you shortly on Ireland AM. You're very welcome back. Now, earlier on uh, this morning, we were discussing a number of things again, but we were also talking about this care shared. Uh, it's basically, it, it takes a village to, to raise a mm -hmm. child. So we know all how expensive childcare is yeah. at the minute, where this is kind of like a, a an Airbnb idea. almost for, for childcare. Yeah, it's Sue Redmond that's here talking to us. It's called careshared.org. And she was like, if any rich person wants to help us build a website, she'd love to hear from you. But Annette says, great idea about child minding, a bit like the film, one Fine Day, starring Michelle Pfeiffer and George Clooney, where I don't, they're both I don't busy. know that film. It is a delightful film. Yeah. It is a gorgeous film. You need to. I went to see it in cinema about anyway, five times. That's what it's meant to be like. Uh, Great idea. Great uh, idea. Annette. Joy well said, forty years ago, we did exactly what you were discussing on the childcare where I lived in Dublin. There was no money exchanged, only helping each other out, and made lifelong friends between parents and children. So this so is lovely. where idea. Like, so. One parent will take over the charge of the children, pick them up from school, mind them for one day. Another parent will do it another day. Yeah, so, so that it's kind gives of reciprocal. Yeah, almost. that parent and there's no money. Those parents exchange. because somebody says here, uh, Jackie no Kershaw should. Um, where is it? Oh yeah, a lot, a lot of look in my local school. A lot of the parents are already doing this. I mentioned to my mum, they have it all sus because a different mummy will collect about five kids each day. I'm assuming this is allowed for others to work or do whatever they need to do. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Great idea. Like the problem is, listen, if a kid hurts themselves, and like, I know, you know, yeah. and the parent is like, well, you weren't looking after. You yeah. don't like. There's that. Like, there's a real trust there, and mm. it'll come down to kind of Being trust trusting. in your gut with and, this and, and knowing, like, okay, kids fall, they yeah. hurt themselves, yeah. they scrape themselves. My mother and was that's a childminder, and it was, and for, it was for, she did it for very little money, but it was sound parents going, kids are going to fall. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's what's going to happen. You have to let and them And not like, oh my God, you didn't look after my child. They fell and scraped their knee. <laughs> but no. you know? A little bit like Jackie said, like imagine, so ch it, it could lead to problems if people start deciding who and can and can't be a part of it because some people might feel ostracized. It would be a bit annoying if like uh, your child never got asked you know, it's like, no, I'm not, didn't, not looking after that say, kid. You yeah. didn't say yes to minding the kids. Yeah. 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 Um, We'd love to hear from you. What do you make of this idea to kind of cut childcare costs? Because, of course, they're crippling for so many people and they don't have family around them. 0896 111 Also, we're going to be talking about Irish cures later on and our Edward Hayden. Ed, he found, he was he trying was to think about of the a skin word. condition. Someone yeah. in Greg Namana who does the cure. So it was for... Shingles. Shingles. <laughs> Tommy got it in so the end. And he puts blood on it. Blood on it. Yeah. And and was it straw? So that was for the... That was for the warts. The warts yeah. he puts So Louise says, it. my mother got her hands badly burned with one of those old chip pans back in the day. And I remember a man with a burns cure coming to our house one evening. His cure was to lick the burns. So he then proceeded to lick mam's hands, finger 
by finger. I will uh, never forget it. No! Now, is that just a dodgy, no. like, nine and a half weeks <laughs> film? Did it work? Did, did it, it work? work? I'll never forget it. She uh, says, I Louise, wouldn't you'd never forget it. Did it work? Because I uh, always thought, like, someone from the football team got a real bad sprain, wasn't ready, needed to back for a big championship match. They'd go and to this healer. And cure, it was fixed the next day. Yeah. So they just put their hands around yeah. it. Is that the whole thing? They're know. healing. Didn't lick it anyway. Uh, more sure. finger licking good uh, <laughs> messages. We'd love them. 0896 triple one triple one about the cures from people in your area. There's so many of them around there this are. country. Are, yeah. uh, now, we're also giving you the opportunity to win the ultimate Christmas experience. This is thanks to Siwi, the award-winning photo printing specialist. We're offering one lucky viewer an all-inclusive two-night trip for two adults and two cool. children to visit Santa in Lapland. Now, the prize also includes return flights, hotel stay, all meals and complimentary thermal gear to keep you and your little ones warm and cosy. They'll also have a Siwi credit to the value of €250 Euro for your winner. So you can create the ultimate Siwi photo book uh, with photos from the experience. Uh, Siwi is one of Ireland's leading providers of photo gifts and offers personalised Christmas cards. So to enter the competition, all you have to do is send in your funniest family Christmas photos. We've already received loads. Send in some more. Give us a bit of a laugh. Uh, send them in to irelandamcomp at virginmedia.ie and you could be going to Lapland. You yeah, could. Siwi will also be given 10 runners up a Siwi gift voucher to create their personalised Christmas cards. Lovely. Now, coming up next. Never we... gonna give you up. Never gonna let you ah, Stop it, stop <laughs> it. He's watching us. He's uh, cringing already. And we'll, we'll stop doing that once uh, we've spoken to him. Rick Astley is going to be joining us after the break. Like in a minute. You're very welcome back. Now, our next guest, he jumped into the music scene back in 1987 mm -hmm. with you're never going to give you up. Like we've been singing it all morning. I can't so apologise. So a song which was number one in 25 different countries. It went along with so many other songs, so many albums. And now over 35 years later, Rick Astley has had a very memorable career. Of course, he is waiting for us. But first, let's take a look at him in action. Rick's like, make it stop, but our camera people are going mad behind here. Never They're like, yeah. Before. Good morning, Rick. How are you doing? Good morning. No, I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a bit much at this time in the morning, I think, all that <laughs> wobbling about in a raincoat. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm good, thank you. thank you. We're an hour in. This oh. is exactly what we need right now. <laughs> We've been going a long time. But we had Pete Waterman on the show the other day, of course, of Stock Aiken right. and Waterman. And he was talking to us about when you were a tea boy in the yeah. office. And he was like, yeah. if he can blast it out when he's making a cup of tea, he was going to be amazing. What was that time like? You were a tea boy. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. They'd, I mean, Pete loves to tell it that way, but they'd actually <laughs> signed me to make a record and then they just got mega busy. They, they had one hit after another and um, they just got to a point where they said, look, we're never going to do anything with this kid. We better get him down to London and get him doing something. Um, so I used to just, you know, sit in sessions, make the tea, make the coffee, get the sandwiches, do whatever was needed, play table tennis with Dead or Alive if I had two or Banana Rama. Um, but I, it was like an education, to be honest. It was kind of like doing an apprenticeship because I got to use their studios a little bit at night and at the weekend. Um, but the main thing about it was I was around the three guys mm -hmm. and I just tried to soak up as much as I could. And as much as Pete will, you know, tell you a story about anything, which he, which he loves to do, um, he's also a very together guy, you know what I mean? He knew, he knew exactly what he was doing. And absolutely, and you could tell that because, mm -hmm. yes, I know that you were signed and you were part of a double act together, but you did eventually go and write that hit, You're Never Gonna Give Me Up. Um, like, it, it was massive. Like, it took the world 
by storm and your career really took off. So by the age, like being a tea boy, being in the car with Pete Waterman, um, you know, soaking up all this, uh, you know, this wisdom, all of a sudden you made it at 21, yeah. like 40 million records. Like what was it like at such an, a young age? Well, you, you've probably heard that story before with, with people you've had talked to. I mean, it, it's, it's very, very hard to kind of like put it in a box and explain it because I couldn't explain it to myself while it was happening or even ever since. It's, it's such a, an emotional, you know, ride because you go from being completely unknown, obviously, um, to being kind of world famous, you know what I mean? In that sort of year or so, um, you know, I ended up doing gigs in places like Tasmania, do you know what I mean? And that's, that's <laughs> saying something. So um, it was pretty mad. Um, but also as well, if I'm blunt about it, you make some money. So you go from like being like a penniless mm. kid who used to play the drums in a band in a little town to this, this kid who's like in videos all around the world and all the rest of it. And then all of a sudden, you're kind of slightly alienated from most of the people you've grown up as well because you're famous, you've got money, you're on the telly all the time. It's a weird balance to try and keep all of your friends and keep all of some sort of real life, you know? So it did, like, looking back on it now, you can be circumspect. Can you see how it changed you? Yeah, I can, definitely, but also I kind of... I'm very grateful, don't yeah. get me wrong. I, I wouldn't swap with anybody. I, I truly would not. You know, I had four or five years of, of all that kind of nonsense and running around. Um, and I had I had a really good time for most of it. I just think towards the end of it, I was just a bit burnt out and I didn't yeah. I didn't really feel I didn't really feel like I was involved in music. I felt like I was involved in selling music. And the two things do go together if you're lucky. They really do if you're lucky. Mm. But I just think there has to be a balance, as with most things in life, you know, and I think Obviously, I'm clocking on now, I'm 57, and I think balance is the most important thing. You can have too much of anything, you know, and, and um, I think I've got the balance right now where I get to do Glastonbury, which is crazy, but I also, you know, get to have a real life as well. So, yeah, it's a, I'm in a good spot, I think, and I think I use, I think I use my past as a barometer and I try and sort of focus on the best times that I'm having right now. Yeah and just say, well, I wouldn't be having them without those early days, you know? So, again, that is a balance as well, so... And you can tell, you can actually tell by your performances how much y you're embracing it. And, like, when you say that, that you decided to step away at 21 years of age, like, you think of a lot of artists that hit superstardom very early mm. and struggle to deal with it as the time goes on. But you, is it... Right, did you meet your wife, Lenny, at that time, or your partner is now I your did. wife manager? I did, yeah. And stepped away for family. Like, was that... Was it family that made you actually... Like, that was a huge decision. Yeah, I think what it was, I think, as I say, after a few years, uh, I'd become a dad, we'd become parents, and I kind of feel that that, for most people, obviously, is a game-changer and it makes you think about life differently. It makes you think, you know, whatever job you have, and mine wasn't a job, you can't call doing what I did a job, but, I mean, you, it, whatever you're involved in, um, you kind of sort of look at everything different. And I kind of feel that, you know, I just felt I'd had a really good time of it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had the attitude that before they throw me out the front door, I'll walk out the back door while no one's looking. And that's kind of what I did. And I, I think I, I'm not fooling myself. I wasn't at the height of any point in my career when I did it. Yeah. Um, but I probably still had a few, you know, bit of life left in the legs kind of thing. But I just felt it was better to walk away then and just say, well, I can go and enjoy being a dad. And I did that for like 50. I didn't do a gig for 15 years. I didn't sing Never Gonna Give You Up for 15 years. The only time that's I sang incredible. it was at weddings. That's the only oh. time I sang it. <laughs> like, that's unbelievable to, to completely go cold turkey like what that. What a present to be like, I'm bestowing yeah, yeah. the song Look. upon you, OK? Enjoy yeah, but, it. But, but I also I also think I, I, I don't want to come across as Mr Corny, but I know how lucky I've been. I know how lucky I've been in the sense that for whatever reason that occurred to me at the time, that, yes, you can just walk away. You don't have to keep plugging away and keep trying to have a hit and it being harder and harder as the years go on. You can just sort of say, I'm just going to knock it on the head, and I did. But again, if I'm, if I'm just going to be blunt about it as well, and I love being this blunt about it, I made some money. Yeah. How many people in their 20s get to earn enough money to say, you know what, I can just pack it in? Yeah. That hardly anybody gets that. And I, and I think, again, I know how lucky I've been and... I think coming back to it, you know, when I started gigging again about 14, 15 years ago, um, I came back to it with a real kind of fun love of it. Yeah. Because I wasn't, I didn't see Never Gonna Give You Up like a millstone round my neck. I saw it like this amazing adventure I had all those years ago. And now I get to go out and have a laugh with it, you know, and have a grin with it. Yeah. And I look at 
You just right. showed a bit of club footage from the, you know, the the audience we played to at Glastonbury, that sea of people. And it's just a fun moment. It's just kind of like, OK, let's get it on. Well, and, Rick, it was that, one of the... Honestly, Guns N' Roses are headlining Glastonbury and everyone's talking about Rick Astley. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. But you Yeah, they didn't said, have that suit, though, did they? They didn't. <laughs> you're dead right. <laughs> but you said that yourself and, and Lenny, your wife, who's also your manager, that you, mm. you walked out to look at it beforehand yeah. and you were like, no-one's here, no one here. we're going to bomb. Yeah, I mean, about... Still, even at 11.30, there was hardly anybody there. I mean, hardly anybody there, to the point where you look at it and we thought, should we do a runner? And we thought, no, we can't do a runner. And, we, and, and she literally said to me, well, this is going to be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then literally within the space of 20 minutes, there's like, I don't know how many people, tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. So, but that's the joy of doing some of those festivals where you've no idea who's in the audience, you've no idea what the audience is. And I think in some bizarre way, it takes the pressure off. If you're a headliner, that's different. Obviously, Elton closed the thing and he was incredible and he had the biggest audience Glastonbury's ever had. So, you know, boom, knock that one out of the park. But for the rest of the people, you kind of have to just go, it takes the pressure off because you just sort of think, well, let's just enjoy it. We're here. And that's what my daughter said to me. She was with us and she said, look, you're already here. You've got the suit on, go and do it, you know, and, and so we just had a lot of fun. It, it was great. It's amazing to be able to have that sort of perspective and to play Glast Glastonbury for the first time on the pyramid stage, the age of 57, yeah, just unbelievable as well. Listen, uh, never going to give you up. It is getting re-released, I believe, um, with a different <laughs> word. Uh, how's for this here. working? Or hearing? It's not, it's not, exact, it's not exactly a re-release. We just re-recorded it recently. I've done, I've done a campaign with Spec Savers, and it's, it's about it's about a number of things for me, actually. Um, hearing, obviously, to me, has been a, a crucial and enormous part of my life. And I've noticed, as I've got a bit older, my hearing's going a bit. And I think that is possibly a little bit about being around loud music, but I think mainly it's probably also an age thing. And the weird thing is, is that if you if you put your glasses on, nobody kind of like judges you about that. Glasses are quite a cool thing these days. But I think there is a bit of a stigma with, with hearing loss and having hearing aids. And um, so I went for a hearing test. And I mean, listen, I'm 57, so the chances are I will have a bit of hearing loss. Um, and I went through this whole process of getting hearing aids made and everything. And I'm still on that journey of how to use them and when to use them, to be honest, because obviously when I'm working and what have you, I already have in ears in, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just a constant thing now. Yeah. Um, well, you've, re, also... you've re recorded the song Never Gonna Give You Up Sorry, with yeah, the misheard that, lyrics. Sorry. Like, we, you we wouldn't have, yeah. get nits from any other guy with all the uh, how people hear it. So, that is yeah. with Spec Savers. And just to let everyone know, your new album, Are We There, um, Are we there Yet? It's out now. And you're going to be in Belfast on March the 4th and Dublin uh, in the Tree Maybe Arena there. on March the 5th, 2024. Rick Indeed. Astley, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's been a grin. Thank you. We'll Thanks see you in March, Rick. Thank you very much Lovely. for that. Pleasure yeah. to have you on. Thanks, guys. Oh, you're very welcome back. It's time for a cure to the sweet tooth. Well, no, this isn't. This is perf <laughs> This is complete indulgence coming up. It certainly is. Edward Hayden is here to make an Irish cream, li Irish cream liqueur and chocolate cheesecake. Oh, there you have it. Good morning. Good oh. morning to you. Just get on with it. Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with the cure. Cut out, cut out all the bits and pieces. Uh, good morning to you. So How this are you, is um, really good. This is a gorgeous cheesecake recipe. So uh, I've teamed up with Irish yogurts, Clonakilty. So I'm going to use yogurt uh, in the filling and the topping for the cheesecake. So it'll be really nice really light yet really decadent and indulgence and I think you'll you'll feel that when you taste it oh, a little bit later on. Is the yoghurt a substitute for something like can you kind of do different types of cheesecake or yeah, yoghurt always in it? Uh, well you, see, you would always use kind of the main base would be cream so I'm using part cream and part yoghurt so oh, I'm taking yeah. half of the okay. cream out of it but then there's kind of for this and recipe. And it's a Greek yoghurt then so I'm quite using, healthy. I'm well, using the Greek yoghurt. Bit well sure listen now listen, look I, I'm sure there's, 40, there's 48 million nutritionists <laughs> would write in and tell me I'd be telling you a lie but anyway, um, now I'm gonna go for the healthier. There you have it, absolutely. Have it. You can have a bigger slice than yeah. Tommy oh, this yes, morning for sure. <laughs> now, what I've got here is I've got my uh, cream cheese and I've just got a little bit of sugar, and I'm just going to beat that quite lightly there whilst I'm chatting with you. I'm going to start off with the base. One of my top tips always is build the cheesecake on the platter rather than using uh, the whole full tin. So, in essence, what I've done is I've taken the bottom off of a loose 
bottom spring form tin and I've just got rid of the bottom and I'm putting the, the ring straight onto my serving platter or my cake stand. Now, now the, make sure that the cake stand or the platter will fit into the fridge. Though. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine you've done no, it all and then you're yeah. trying to... Slip. We all have those, we all have those <laughs> fridges. Just thinking. Yeah, yeah. Take <laughs> out, all like, done go, take oh, out all the vino, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> now, the then what I've got is I've got my biscuits. Can I just talk to you about the biscuits? Now, I've used some of the bourbon cream biscuits. You can use whatever type of biscuits. You can use chocolate chip cookies. You can use digestives. You can use rich tea, whatever. I've used the bourbon cream. And if I can just show you, I literally just popped them in to the food processor last night but I just pulsed them you might be able to pick up there yeah. there's just a bit of texture in okay. them so I don't yeah. want them to be too fine, too fine or too cured okay then what I've got is I've got some melted butter I've just melted that and I'm going to mix that together uh, in my bowl until all of that comes together into a nice buttery mixture Okay. okay, so give that a nice little mix around. How and much then, butter? Now, I've used just slightly less butter than I would normally use. I've used to use about four ounces of butter there because the cream from the middle of the biscuits will be a little bit moist, more moist than if you had a digestive biscuit. Oh, and I've nice. got a pound there, 450 grams of biscuits uh, as well. So I'm going to pile all of that there into the, the tin. And then what I'm going to do is, I'll just pop that down there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use like a little potato masher just to squash that down. So I want that to be just nice and neat there along the along the bottom. So okay. that's the base of the cheesecake. That's the best, but ready you know to go. I'll just have that. That's yeah, I love the bit. base myself. <laughs> I, know, I think it. the base is lovely. Yeah. Now, so once this has mixed up, which it has, you'll be um, sure to say, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in my other few bits and pieces. Okay. So first and foremost, what I've got is I've got some whipped cream here. So I'm just going to put in some whipped cream. And to that then, I'm also going to put in some of the yogurt. So as I said, I've got the Irish yogurt Clannacilt. I'm using the low-fat Greek-style natural yogurt. So it's just nice and thick there, well, you can what see. Were you, what were yeah. you whipping? Pardon? What were you whipping? The cream cheese. Cream oh, cheese right. and the sugar. So there's cream cheese, cream and yogurt. And yogurt, yeah. OK. What? So I'm going to pop all of that in and then I'm going to turn yeah. that back ah, on there God. to the mixer. To that, I'm going to put in a lovely glass of Irish cream liqueur. So something like Bailey's or Cool Swan or something. I brought it in the kind of the Christmas, the Christmas glass, glass, like yeah. the one you'd be having at the fire or Christmas night. It's a pretty didn't bring two more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with wines so later on. Let's, 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 I not, tell you let's now. not peak too soon. Absolutely. Is are bad enough? If I was to give you his Bailey's, I tell you, <laughs> it would be that. carnage. Love There'd be that. no cheesecake. Now, pop that on just like that. What's really interesting, and just uh, to for people to be aware of, the really interesting part of this is the thickening agent. So I'm going to turn that off now. And the thickening agent is actually the chocolate. OK? When I mean thickening, I also mean setting agent. So into that, I'm going to put in um, yeah, while you're my doing chocolate. That, I'm going to grab the one that's in there. Yeah, OK, pop that in. So I'm going to pop in my chocolate just like so. Oh. And then literally just give that one little mix around, just like so. Oh, my so it's goodness. Lovely. Look at that. Now, so pop the cheesecake then, the whole mixture. I could give you a little lick of the whisk, really. Uh, mm. So what I'm going to do is pop that whole mixture in on top of the biscuit base, just like so. So make sure that it's all mixed up really well, OK? and pop all of that in on top of the base. And it's absolutely delicious. OK, so really nice and creamy. How long does it go into the fridge now, for them? Now, you want is to it leave overnight? it overnight, Jay. Yeah. You want to be leaving it overnight to set. So spread all of that along there really nicely. And then what I'm going to do is just finish off. So I'll perfect that in a few minutes. Finish off the one that we have made. So I'm going to take some of the lovely yogurt. So take off the ring, obviously. And I'm going to take another little bit of our lovely yogurt. Just spread that decadently. Uh, across the top, okay, right out to the edges. Ah, ah, and then what I've got go. here is I've got some lovely um, dark and white chocolate, which Look I'm literally going to oh. put on the top. Okay. And then I've got some fresh raspberries because you wanted it healthy. So again, when you put fruit, I worked with a lady years ago and she used to always tell me, put fruit on top of everything and they'll buy it and they'll think it's healthy. Oh, okay, gonna we're going to taste it, it during the break because we have to go. Edward, oh, that You're looks very absolutely welcome. delicious. You're very Stay welcome. with us. We've got some wonderful uh, winter events that you can enjoy if you visit Dublin over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Please, sir. See you in a few minutes. <laughs> oh.
Thanks for staying with us. Now is the perfect time to book a weekend away in Dublin. Is it? Now is now. the time. Get on that phone now. <laughs> Here to tell us about what the capital city has to offer this winter, it is travel blogger Sarah Hanner. And hello, Hi, Sarah. Good Lovely morning to have you. To you. Now, before morning. we chat to you, we have a little question for you at home. And we're asking you, how big is St. Stephen's Green? If you know the answer, <laughs> let us know by scanning the QR code on the screen now. So is it... 27 acres or uh, 37 acres. You is know, that every it? time we do one of these... 27 acres or 37 acres. I realise that acres mean nothing to me. No, do you know, know what I mean? I'm the so same. I haven't a clue. It has to be We're going to let you know. We're going to let you know a little later on. It's but there, lovely. You can cue the, uh, the QR code <laughs> yeah, there. Scan, scan it. it there. It's lovely to have you with us. Now, you're Thank telling you. us about some places to visit in Dublin. This is when I always feel really bad when we, I do things about Limerick, Kerry and Dublin. I'm like, I've never been <laughs> there. Um, so you're going to tell us about the little museum at Stephen's Green. I am. So I'm teaming up with Fall to Ireland to help people plan their short breaks to Dublin this winter. There are so many things happening at our regular events and our one-off events, like our comedy shows and our theatre events. But also now we have Winter in Dublin, which is a specific programme of activities that happen throughout the winter months. So from now until January, January 31st. Oh. And we have... I'll be able to share a fraction of them today, but we've loads more happening, loads more going on. You can find all the details on visitdublin.com. Love Loads of things, like pantos and everything all oh, over Christmas. Oh, there's endless. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The pantos, too. <laughs> the little, most important. Not time for you, my friend. <laughs> The Little Museum, there's something going on the there. The Little Museum, so every Wednesday, every Thursday, Friday and Saturday from now until December 30th, you can go into the Little Museum after hours, you can do a guided tour with a glass of wine. So you, you can do a glass of wine. I actually passed it the other day. It's, it's so handy on Stephen's And it's little in name, but not in, in the amount of stuff they have happening in there. There's loads and loads of historical yeah. artefacts. Derek has been there, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. We've done it's some stuff incredible. There. There's lots of music memorabilia. There's U2 memorabilia. You could go for a walk in Stephen's Green beforehand, maybe go for dinner in Eto afterwards. Oh, nice. I love you're Eto. having a lovely yeah. little day. <laughs> Count the acres while you're in Stephen's Green as well. So there's loads of memorabilia from in and around Dublin. And, there is. And, and, you, go out, you, and you can go you can go after work, you can go before dinner and, and get a glass of wine while you're in there as well. So it's a really a chance to see the museum. Okay, lovely. We're going to. And move. is it just all about Dublin? So it's mostly Irish history, oh, Irish artifacts, history. And, and a lot of music memorabilia, but kind of Irish-related elements inside it. There's, there's an incredible amount in there. It's, it's yeah. not small at all. It's a, it's a gorgeous Georgian building as well. Uh, one of the things I love to do all the time is go to the National Gallery, just have a lovely wonder love around. Yeah. And every time I go, I feel like it's different. They have their permanent exhibitions, but they have the, the one off Visiting ones, well. ones all and the time. And then they yeah. move stuff and you can't find it. They I'm do. like, where is my picture gone? So, what's going so on there? in the National Gallery, they have loads going on for winter in Dublin as well. They have different themed nights. So there's one in September, there's one in November and there's one in December. The one in November is a Spanish themed night, so the Spanish Spanish food tasting, Spanish performances, Spanish movie screenings. Oh, and these are free. Right. The ones in the National Gallery are free as well. So you can you can go and just enjoy the evening. It's going to be beautiful. And the, they have a festive, festive themed evening happening on the 7th of December. And I'm raging. I can't go to this. I'm not actually free on this evening. And I will be there in a heartbeat because it's the Gloria LGBT choir. And they used to play in St. Patrick's Cathedral every year. I used to go and see them every year. They're unbelievable. They don't do it anymore. So if one of them's listening, if one of them's watching and wants to do it again, they're amazing. So in the National Gallery, the LGBT choir, Gloria, are playing. They have mulled cider, mince pies. Uh, you can go to a workshop on that evening as well in the gallery and make your own Christmas decoration. Oh, that's yeah. nice. And that's what all free as well. That's the 7th of December and Seven. it's free to go to as well. And sure, listen, we'll, all of us called cheese will be up on the 8th anyway. That's so just yeah. come up the you night before. Up the night does before that still happen? Yeah. Day oh, we were, we were, Nassau Street. No, once we got boots in other places, we were like, we don't have to go <laughs> we up have anymore. To go to Dublin, we don't have no. to go up anymore. Once you got online shopping. Um, no. it's, it's, uh, it's such a beautiful place. Stunning, the modern part of the building and then the old building. It's beautiful. It's really relaxing to go in there as well. And then speaking of older buildings, St. Patrick's Cathedral. They have loads of stuff going on for 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 winter in Dublin. They have after hours tours. You can go in and explore the cathedral when the doors are shut and the lights, well, the lights are on, you can see the area, but if there's no one else in there, the bells are ringing. So it'd be a really incredible time to see the cathedral. They have some, they have eagles, eagles by candlelight. So they have concerts, eagles concerts by candlelight. So it's West End singers who are performing. And now this is quite popular. So if people are interested, if people like the sound of this, definitely go on to visit Dublin.com and book because it will sell out. Tickets are 30 euro and it's can candlelit concerts in the cathedral. Yeah, I've seen them. They look amazing. Oh, like amazing. they're doing George Michael ones, they're doing Abba yeah. ones, they're doing loads of different artists. Yeah. And they're incredible. And they also have the Jonathan Swift Festival, which is happening at the end of the month. He's the former Dean of St. Patrick's yeah. Cathedral and a celebrated Irish writer. So you go in and there's different things happening throughout the, the few days at the and festival. There's lovely running. markets there beside the gardens there. Yes, there outside. There's markets at the weekends yeah, that are there's so loads, popular now. There's loads going on. And for the Jonathan Swift Festival, there's performances, there's guided tours, there's debates. 
Yeah, it's it's gorgeous. And Brian yeah. Kennedy will always talk about the acoustics in churches. Unbelievable. Yeah. How they're so amazing. And if you hear something inside in St. Patrick's Cathedral, it'll stay with you forever. And it's the it's perfect so time of year to go to any sort of musical something event in like Ireland. Anything, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's beautiful. The Epic Museum. Yes, so Sing Ireland are doing pop-up concerts in the Epic Museum on four Sundays across November and December. So you go in and you can see everything happening in the Epic Museum. There's endless things to see. I've been there several times. And I feel like every time I go, I see something that I didn't see before. And then for these Sundays, you go in and there'll be festivals of music, there'll be live singers downstairs as well. You're getting us very Christmassy in November, aren't you? You're well, this, really, this is, you're this is November. Forward. This is November and December. So yeah. there's, lots, there's lots going on for winter in Dublin. There's loads of things that aren't festive themed, and there's loads of things that are sort of later into I the year. I suppose like the winter lights in Dublin Zoo, and there's loads of other there's little loads, things and like that. And, and, and Dublin Castle, Castle, Castle and, and, and Malahide Castle. Christmas market yeah. in Dublin Castle as well. It's yeah. not ticketed this year as well, which is amazing because it yeah. has been up to now. Oh, so loads. You can just stroll in. Stroll in. That is so nice. Uh, where can people find out more about this, Sarah? Visit Dublin.com. All the information, all the details for booking, all the prices, times, dates, everything like that. And there's loads of things happening. It's not just what I talked about. There's endless things going on. You'll find out way more there if you want to go for it the day, not just shopping to get your sugar plum fairy lip balm, as I always did when I came <laughs> up to Dublin when I was younger. Now we had a megaphone. How big is... Um, is Stephen's Green? Is it 27 acres or 37 acres? Most of you are Most saying 27. Is it right, though? Do we Does know? know? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Seventy-one percent of you said twenty-seven acres. We don't know if it's right or not. We'll find we'll out. Find if it's out. Right. <laughs> Sarah Hanrahan. Keep them guessing. Thank you so much for it. It is right. Oh. It is right. Yes, it is right. We should really. So know most of you that. did get it right. Thank you. And coming today's up... show is brought to you by Alan Partridge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Coming up in the final hour, we're talking about what to watch this weekend from a Nicolas Cage comedy to a tense space odyssey. Yes, and we're on the Vino. We'll need it. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. It started already, it would appear. <laughs> Dublin Discovery Trails app and Dublin City Council have teamed up with Ireland AM this week to give one lucky viewer the chance to win an overnight stay in the Mason Hotel Dublin along with a range of exciting experiences including the Guinness Storehouse, Epic and the Little Museum of Dublin. Explore and learn all there is to know about Dublin's rich culture and history through Ireland's first augmented reality map and treasure hunt. Discover is a new augmented reality experience that harnesses the power of AOR and Google Maps, transforming the way tourists and locals immerse themselves in Dublin. Simply download the Dublin Discovery Trails app via the App Store to learn more about Dublin's rich culture and take part in the treasure hunt to see Dublin's wonderful landmarks. For your chance to win, just text WIN to 57199 or call 1550 treble and answer this question. In what Irish city would you find the Molly Malone statue? Is it A, Dublin or B, Galway? Best of luck. Hello, welcome back. Uh, we were, we are going to be talking about traditional cures from around Ireland in just a little while. There is a brand new book and we'd asked you about your cures not going to the doctor, but something that's been handed down from generation to generation. We've got loads oh, in. Totally. So many in. Charlie says, when we were younger, our man would bring us to an old woman who had a cure for warts, because we were talking about warts earlier on. She would rub chicken poo on the warts. There you go. And it worked. Did it work? It must have worked with the chicken poo. You went oh, what? 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 Charlie didn't say if it worked or not. No. <laughs> what was the what text did. earlier we had then from somebody saying about that the, the person with the cure licked the licked fingers? Finger. Oh, yeah, there's so, like, that's we have here licked somewhere. Each individual finger. So, yeah. a person texted earlier on their mother Patricia. had burnt her fingers picking up a chip pan, and then the man who had the cure for the burns came over to the house and licked her mother's fingers in front of. Like Everybody. KFC. Yeah, because Patricia so, said it there. So we kind of said, oh, I don't know about that. But then Patricia said, don't, don't knock know. the cure for the burn till you've tried it. I went for the cure. The man spat on his fingers and rubbed the burn. The burn started to heal the next day. I've gone back to him a few times, taken my son one time, works brilliantly, no scar either. So he Patricia, just why spit. Do you keep, why do you keep burning yourself? Well, to be <laughs> careful. I think if he spits on his hand and does it better, then as opposed to like... 
lick it, like sticking your finger. It's in a lot mouth. better. Than <laughs> what about but, the saliva uh, from snails? Uh, this one, I, I, th I think there might this. be something to yeah. it. Helen is in Newbridge today. Good morning, Helen. At the age of 10, I had 23 warts covering both hands. My dad rubbed the saliva from snails on each wart and in just one week, all of them were gone. And I remember that the from snail, younger yeah. people putting snails on kids' hands who yeah. had warts and they just let them... <laughs> yeah. It was like Mario Kart, they're um, going around the snails. And then we have another one. Sean said, two sons had verrucas which were cured with banana skin. There you have it. Well, no. Applied to the verrucas daily until they fell off. Listen. We were talking, Jennifer Rock was talking about banana skins last week. She was. Saying what? Mm -hmm. About rubbing banana skins on your skin, it's good Bana for your like it's good for your skin. <laughs> she was <laughs> seriously okay. Well, there you have it. So Veruca's warts a whole lot. Get the snails, <laughs> get the saliva, get the banana skin. Well, the Just try everything. And so see something this work. man spit on it. So is this man? He was like a healer. Well, it's type obviously thing. a healer. Somebody so, who has the cure. Yes. So, so if I spit on it, it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> I don't know. Well, to be fair, that could infect you with if, more. I'd say. <laughs> if Alan Hughes tries to spit in you this weekend, he's God. Doing it for medicinal oh, purposes. Oh my everybody. God! Do you know what? I think we might move on. Uh, we're just going to park that. Then. Yeah. Uh, keep your mouth like that. Earlier on in the show, we were telling you Be about a competition we were running with thanks to Siwi, the award-winning photo printing specialist. They're offering one lucky viewer an all-inclusive two-night trip for two adults and two children to visit Santa in Lapland. So to enter, we asked you to send in your funniest family Christmas photos. We've already got loads in. We had loads the last couple of days. But here today we have Eileen who sent us in a picture of herself and her family at Christmas. She says they're all still, they get up at half seven on Christmas morning, even though the kids are all adults now. Look at that. The all Irish ready jersey on, ready, yeah. ready for Paris. Yeah. Nicole sent in this picture of her mum getting cosy with Santa Claus. Santa. Oh, Don't Santa be baby. Fingers. Coming down the um, chimney tonight. Sanita has taken a trip down memory lane with her picture ah, from Christmas love. Eve in 1997 of all of her children excited love for it. Santa's arrival. Look at that, even the same pyjamas back then as well. Uh, and finally, <laughs> Carolette has sent in this picture of her old daughter Sadie meeting Santa for the first time back in 2017. Not very happy. No, she was just nine months old and she said she's not sure who was more scared. Poor, poor old Santa even looks like, traumatised. What's she doing? Why that poor that child. Yeah. I love even on the top of the, 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 the seat, it's just a chair on it. Did you see that? That's, That's coming out of That's a funny one. I like that one. You could be going to yeah, Lapland. Sure. Like, can you beat that one? Send them in oh, to us. Uh, if you want to do, send it in to Comp at virginmedia.ie. Now, after the break, we've got space race dramas and tell all documentaries. Yeah, stay tuned for more. Welcome back. Lots of news from the world of Hollywood. And we're joined by entertainment.ie's Brian Lloyd. Hello, Brian. Hey. It's lovely to have you here. First off, we're going to talk about the actor's yes. strike. It's in the news this morning. Yes. So finally, the uh, sag after strike is over. It ended last night. Uh, the deal is set to basically change pretty much fundamentally what actors are paid. They're going to get participation bonuses now from uh, streaming shows. They have protections against artificial intelligence. That's the first time that that's ever been added into mm -hmm. a strike contract or an actor's contract. Um, the deal is set to be voted on, I think, tomorrow and then it'll be ratified. But this basically means now that actors can start promoting their films again. So that means you're going to see like them on the likes of Graham Norton. You're going to see well, them on... Did you notice Graham Norton last week? Because normally he gives his full lineup for the next yeah. week. He only mentioned one person because obviously they were getting the news going, we might have... Different yeah, people on next week because this is going to be done. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I mean, already like I've been like sent emails saying we may possibly have such and such in the yeah, next yeah. couple of weeks. Can you schedule time for it? Blah 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 blah. So yeah, like I mean, and even as well in terms of like you know films that were in production or whatever, they're all going to restart right now, literally today. So this, I mean, this went for a long time. Like, yeah. Who have have the the actors won out big time in this? Oh, like, definitely. Are, yeah. As opposed to the studio, like it's against the studios, wasn't it? Oh, so, it was. Yeah. So like even with AI and mm. protections against that, like nobody knows where that's going at the minute. So that's how the thing. do they? 
kind of put those protections in whenever we don't really know. Yeah, what's... well, this is it. Like, see, they negotiate, they renegotiate their contract every three years. So after okay, three years, right. they'll come back to them and say, right, we need to do more to stop. So there could be strikes again in three oh, more yeah, years. Oh, yeah, easily. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But as of this moment, they cannot record and use their voices in perpetuity. Yeah. They cannot record their face and use them in perpetuity as a background actor. They okay. can't bring back, because uh, obviously Robin Williams' yeah. daughter, Zelda, Zelda has spoken was big so on much yeah. about them wanting to bring her father back. And she's like, I'm sorry, you don't own him. I do. So um, hopefully we'll get to hear some nice famous people chatting about yeah, the Yeah, no, it'll be again. good. It's going to be good. It's all good. And like the deal, like I say, is pretty is pretty substantial. Good. I mean, the only downside, if you want to say it, is, is that there probably will be less TV shows and less movies because they're going to, the studios are going to say we're going to have to pay actors more. But that's a good thing. To be that, fair, that's a good that's thing. That's a good thing. There's a enough out there at the minute and a lot of it is crap. It yeah. seems so. like... A, and we'll get on to one, yeah. uh, is that, like, it seems they're churning oh, yeah, stuff out at yeah. the minute. And yeah, the yeah. Marvels, which is the first movie that we are going to discuss, it seems, again, it's another one just being churned out. Quali uh, quantity over quality. Oh, 100%. Like, I mean, this is like the 30 something Marvel kind of thing at the minute. Yeah, so what's going on in this is Brie Larson plays Captain Marvel. She is now teaming up with Miss Marvel, who's played by Iman Villani, and uh, Tiana Paris, who people would probably remember from WandaVision, if you saw that. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on in this is it's kind of like a Freaky Friday thing. Uh, their powers are entangled, so each time they use their powers, they get zapped to the other person's body and then get zapped around the place. Uh, Zoe Ashton, who is actually Mrs. Tom Hiddleston, yeah, uh, she plays mm. the villain in this. What I would say about the Marvels is that you, if you've seen one of these films, you've seen them all. That's kind of always <laughs> been a problem with Marvel movies. This one is probably the most egregious example of okay. it because it is literally just like they are just copying and pasting the entire story from previous movies. How are they doing that? Is that down to the writers or the, the actor's strike? Or this was no, that's just, that. that's just bad writing. That's just bad writing. That's just terrible writing. Right. So we're in whatever phase of Marvel they have Mar this uh, Phase five. And there is the rule that when something is about to fail, as Marvel has been doing for the past two years, throw give it to in. a woman yeah. so that they can be the one who kills it. What are you giving the Marvels? Two out of five. And it is in the cinemas? Uh, no, this Friday. This Friday. OK, we're going to move on to another movie. It's called Dream Scenario. Yeah, this it's good. So Nicolas Cage plays this very, very down-to-earth, very, very boring college professor who inexplicably finds himself appearing in people's dreams. Um, yeah, and I know you're kind of like, you're saying, huh? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's like. It's literally, people are having these weird, freaky dreams and Nicolas Cage's character just walks through them. So really what this film is about is kind of a metaphor for celebrity culture and the idea of how would actually the most boring person in the world deal with suddenly being thrust into the spotlight? And then does he then start to kind of chase celebrity culture as well? How does he feel about it when he's on the downward slope? Um, Nicolas Cage is an actor that is generally kind of known for playing like really over the top performances yeah. and going crazy and doing the screaming and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. In this, he's just playing, you see him there like this doughy, middle-aged, boring man. <laughs> and he kind of manages to funnel all his weirdness into kind of like the little odd foibles that people kind of have, you know? Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. It's very, very funny. Okay. Very, very satirical. I really enjoyed it. He, he, so he's funny in it. He's yeah, because, he's and he's yeah, a really like, good comedic actor. Yeah. yeah, he can be funny when he wants to be like. And um, and with this, he's kind of brought it all back like he was an adaptation. He's yeah. very insular. Uh, what are you going to? Because people are going, oh, he might get another Oscar. What are you giving? I this? wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I could yeah. see him getting nominated. I could see him getting nominated. I don't know if he'd win, but he definitely get nominated. Four out of five. Wow. I really enjoyed it. Four out of okay. five. We'll take a, we'll take, that. Are we taking a look at Dream Scenario? No, we're going to go no, and sorry. take a look at Robbie Williams. I said, Robbie Williams yeah. has got a new documentary coming out on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I think it's a four-parter, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a four-parter. Yeah. We'll, uh, we have a little VT of it. Let's take a quick look. You know, you're only supposed to do this at the pearly gates of St. Peter. This looking back at your life. Can I join take that? Oh, I was 16. It was insane. I was the centre of the pop culture world. One of the world's greatest showmen. Do you wish sometimes to have a normal life? This is a normal life. I felt like I was giving more and more of myself away to the point where you're not somebody you recognise. Okay. Oh, point and shot there. Mm. This documentary, new one to Netflix. Yeah. And it has gotten varied reviews. I think mm. The Guardian gave it two stars, yeah. saying it's just narcissism gone amok. Whereas I think The Telegraph have given it like five stars going, it's a really it's insightful that. view into a superstar's life. So, is it 
Is it just Robbie chatting about himself? It is. Okay. Literally that. For four episodes, it's him watching this, like, thousands of hours of behind-the-scenes footage that he's po possibly never seen before and reacting to it in real time. Like, it's literally him in the bed in his L.A. mansion with a laptop just watching this stuff and reacting as it goes, and then it cuts back to the footage. Then you kind of see, like, Ada Field walking around in the background, and he kind of talks to her a little bit about some of the footage that he's seen. Oh. Yeah, like, I mean, compared to something like Beckham, where well, it had... Well, that's what I was going to say, yeah. because Beckham was as narciss narcissistic yeah, it was. as ever. Like, I mean, produced, and, it, yeah. and ultimately produced, but he came out of it really well. He in did, this, that's the thing. Where you know, I... Robbie Williams has done something similar again, but you kind of seem to think that he doesn't come out of it very well. So, it... is that not a good reflection, actually, where On you're getting a warts and all? I mean, yes. That is true, but I do think in the case of, like, Robbie Williams, it almost kind of seems like he's having a little bit of a pity party for himself. It's like, you know, yes, he had these terrible uh, reaction to, you know, fame and celebrity and all the rest of it. He had drug and alcohol problems and all the rest of it, and anxiety. But then, like, you know, when he talks about Guy Chambers, when he talks about, you know... Guy Chambers was a songwriting, was a songwriting partner, partner when he, partner he that exploded. He worked yeah. And then, you know, his relationships with Nicola Appleton and Jerry Halliwell and then, you know, all the aggro he had with Gary Barlow. It kind of... He almost kind of seems to be placing himself in the role of the victim okay. when we're not getting their side of the story. And it's But very, he does open up about it. He's he quite does open up about it. about it, but, like, he's given his side of the story. and like Just and, his documentary. Yeah, but, like, I mean, you know... The documentary is meant to be uh, rounded. It's meant to be rounded. Like, I mean, Beckham, at least, you know, they had, like, you know, Roy Keane coming in and telling his side of the story. They didn't have Rebecca lose. Well, they didn't have Rebecca lose, obviously. But it's just, I don't know, I felt that this was a very much kind of, like, I did, did agree with the Guardian review. I did think this was, like, misery, navel gaze, and a little bit too kind of introspective. I, th mm. I think maybe he is a troubled person. I think person he's a troubled that person, is very yeah. Very isolated. So, what did he give in relation to his relationship with, with Gary Barlow? Because obviously, over the years, mm. they've gotten back together. Take that. Yeah, but I mean, they talk about, like, the early years, the fact that he was annoyed about how Gary Barlow seemed to be taking over all the songwriting and take okay, that. So, as that, we all knew, yeah. Yeah, which was, which is, well, documented and also as well that Gary Barlow was very much the leader of the group and Robbie Williams as you said there he was like 16 17 years old and he's just at that age where he's just going to be bumping up against yeah. authority mm -hmm. and stuff um, okay. it's like I mean I think you'd really have to be into Robbie Williams to okay. appreciate it and like I like Robbie Williams I thought No Regrets is a great pop song mm -hmm. and all the rest of it I Angels obviously was a big hit, yeah. um, but unless you are like a big Take That fan a big Robbie Williams fan I don't think you're going to get okay. out of this okay. are you giving it Two out of five. Okay. And a four-parter as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, like, and he had some classic tunes as well. So oh, yeah, yeah be interesting yeah. to see. Um, let's finally talk on Mean Girls. Yes. What's coming up there? Yeah. So there's a new version of Mean Girls is coming out. This is going to be a musical. It's kind of like a remake of Mean Girls. I can see your eyes just glazing okay. over, Tommy. Is are all the same? Is Regina George there? Yeah, is... Regina George is there. Okay. Yeah, and all of them are there. Yeah, and it's the, the same classics. crew that have just done a, an ad for Walmart. No, 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 no. no, no it's, it's not a that. Cast. No, it's, no, it's not a cast. cast. It's a new yeah. cast. It's a younger cast. Sorry. Now Tina Fey is back in it. Um, and a few other actors from the original are back in it as well, but it's not the Walmart ad. This is like... It's, okay. it's, 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 it's a musical, so they're all singing, all dancing in it. Um, I don't know. I mean, <sighs> yeah. So it's getting an awful lot of buzz online. With Tina Fey, the yeah. original creator, being involved, yeah. it gives you an awful lot of hope. An awful lot is being done with musicals. Sure. Mamma Mia has set off a chain reaction. Yeah. I mean, Matilda the musical. Yeah, Great. definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, if uh, a studio drove a truck full of money up to my house and asked me to remake mm -hmm. a film that I made, I mean, I'm not immune. Anyone would do that. And that's kind of what Tina Fey did here. She okay. was like, I wrote this thing already. Now I'm just going to write a couple of songs and collect a very big fat check for it. So fair play. I mean, well done. Uh, when, okay. when is it out? Uh, I think 2024, I think. Okay. 2024. 2024. So it's based on the same story. Same story. With obviously the cast yep. who are younger because yep. they're all aged out. Uh -huh. and they're singing songs. That's literally it. So a burn That's book. A, what's not to love? What's not to love? There you, you like Mean it. Girls, it could be free. Uh, Brian Lloyd from entertainment.ie. Excellent to have you as always. Very interesting. Which, which one would you watch? Dream Scenario. Yeah. With Nicolas Cage. Yes. Yeah. That's what I want okay. to see. Thank Robbie you, Brian.
Hello, welcome back. It's time for wine, and we're tasting some of the finest bottles from the best regions in Europe. And we hate this bit, don't we? We do, <laughs> we're I know. We're here to talk us through it as wine connoisseur and owner of Nude Wine Company, Michelle Lawler. Good morning to you, Michelle. Good morning. Now, we're very excited about this, because you think you saying these are really the best wines from all these regions. Yeah, these are iconic wines from Europe, and a lot of times people want to know, what is it worth it? Why are they the best? So we're going to ta um, taste through the one of the world's most famous white wines, which is Sancerre, if you mm -hmm. want to have a little yeah, taste. Yeah, no, Sancerre. And I was saying to you, Sancerre with a screw cap, because I always thought Sancerre would be a corked wine. People as associate a cork closure with quality. Yeah. But an actual, and, and it's true in some regards, and these reds need a cork closure because it helps them to evolve and develop, especially they're a little bit older. Mm. But Sancerre is meant to be drunk fresh and young. Yeah. Sancerre is the homeland for Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? <laughs> it's what it's all about. So Sancerre is a little mm, place near Paris. And the rule is, if you want to call your wine Sancerre, the grapes have to be grown in the Sancerre region and they have to be 100% Sauvignon Blanc. And it's the reason why Sauvignon Blanc is grown all over the world, because mm. Sancerre is so well, it's so good. So yeah. that's, so they were the, the leaders in yeah. it? Before yeah, it went to New Zealand and Australia everywhere. and this everywhere. Is, this is like the homeland for it. And Sancerre, is, the place is about the same size as Dundalk. So it's like the Champagne region. You can't call it Champagne unless it's that's exactly the Champagne it. region. That's exactly it. Dundalk, it... you're posher than I thought. <laughs> Fair play, to you, lads. <laughs> We're going to plant a few vines up there now and see what happens. But it's a tiny place and everyone in the world wants it. So you can imagine there must be something about it if everyone wants it something. Likes well, everybody knows when you're looking for a, a nice white in a restaurant, a Sancerre is always a good and one. And that's the point I was going to get to. And if we want to move along and taste a few of the, the next ones, people drink with their eyes. You know the phrase, people eat with their eyes? Yeah. When you look at a label, Oh, You'll yeah, know totally. in advance. And that's why these ones are great reference points if you're thinking, OK, I'm going to get a nice bottle of wine for Christmas, a gift for a wine connoisseur or whatever. These are drinking with your eyes. I know immediately it's premium, it's yeah. good quality. Now, I know the name Valpolicella on a, for a nice red wine because yeah. if you get a Valpolicella, it's always really a nice red yeah. wine. So we'll try this one. So this is a Valpolicella Rapasso. And what this actually is is a baby Amarone. Have you ever heard of Amarone? Yes. It's in the premium section. Mm. It's a real Italian wine lover uh, style wine. So the grapes are picked or are grown, picked in um, September. Ooh. Yeah, it's really Ooh. rich. Have it with a little bit of food, actually. It'll taste beautiful. This is a perfect one to have with a cheese board after Christmas dinner. Um, so the grapes for Amarone yeah. are dried for three months, so through Christmas. And the wine is actually made in January. And what happens is those grapes, and they're the best grapes in the whole region, the water evaporates, the sugar concentrates, and you've got a really rich wine. Oh, it's but, delicious. But I know. And the Amarone is 40 or 50 euro. This is 24 euro. And the difference is, oh. this is called Rapasso. So they get the grape skins from the Amarone and they repass or repasso them through the next best parcel of Valpolicella to get basically a baby Amarone, really good quality wine without the big price tag. So 23, 23 for a bottle of this. Uh, that is actually delicious. It's yeah. so good. And Irish people love it. It appeals to their palate because it's spicy and chocolatey and yeah. rich. There's a bit of oak. And these wines, we've put them in a Best of Europe pack. You can okay. buy them individually. But if you wanted something that ticks all the boxes. Essentially, if you're getting ready, because I do that, like if I'm buying wine, I get a Sancerre or Primitivo as a present for Christmas because I know they're going to be yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So, lads, screenshot what you're looking at here. Yeah, okay. yeah. I need to get it. Where's no, the food when, from today, by the way? The food is from the Gate Cafe, a new gorgeous cafe in Parmistown. The Gate gorgeous. Cafe? The Gate Cafe. I love it. No, the Gate. G A T E. Oh, gate. <laughs> <laughs> the Gate Cafe. The ga <laughs> my Talk about unconscious <laughs> bias. Alan, like, the Gate Cafe. The I'm Gate there. Cafe, I'm going on there. <laughs> All right. Lads, we'll try the next two when together. You say, when you're saying a Grand Cru, you always think maybe this is going to be special. But is it? Yes. If you're saying Grand is. Cru, it is. So we're going to try the next two wines, and I think we should try them together nearly oh. as a comparison. Oh. One is a Bordeaux. So Saint-Emilion Grand Cru is a premium Bordeaux wine, mm -hmm. and Rioja Grand Reserva is the best of Rioja. Grand Cru is a place. So if you think of all of Saint-Emilion or all of Bordeaux, they've designated regions that are better. OK? Yeah. So, and the Rioja, or the, the Saint-Emilion Grand Cru, it's got a bit of oak. There's only 100,000 bottles made. It's dense and dark. It's a little bit more black fruit oh. flavour. No. I wouldn't be mad about that. It's not the Santa Million. Well, try it against the Rioja. See, I much I prefer this now. The oh, that everyone loves a Valpolicella oh, Rapasso. Try the Rioja, because no, I'm try very the surprised. That it's so good. It's delicious. It's so delicious. So Rioja Gran Reserva 
unlike oh, that's Santa, much nicer. Unlike a Santa Million, the Grand Cru, you have to be in that place to make the Grand Cru. The Grand Reserva, anyone in Rioja can make a Grand Reserva, but they have to tick some criteria. Okay. Rioja Grand Reserva is only made in exceptional vintages. Okay, so you know if, if it's called Grand Reserva, it must be really good. Okay. And Grand Reserva means that the wines have gone through a specific aging process. Two years in a barrel and three years in the bottle. So, it, Grand Reserva tells you it's oaky, but implies it's really, really, really good. Gotcha. And see, okay. three years in a bottle, like I said, could you have that for another two years and open it then? Oh yeah, and it'll be delicious. But the thing with Rioja... So what's the difference? Why is that so much nicer than that one? Is it just my, my it's palette? A, my palette. This is like... a Merlot. Santemilion is always predominantly Merlot. Okay. 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 And so sometimes people don't really like, they might be mad about and Merlot. And what's this one? This is Tempranillo. That's the classic. And this is oh, Yeah, gosh, and it's yeah. Um, Spain's best grape. Oh. But the thing with Rioja, the way they do it, the Crianza, the Reserva, the Gran Reserva, the whole region can produce it, and it depends on the winemaker themselves. Of what they but do. what they mm. do is they release the wines when they're perfect and ready to drink. Right, right. okay. Well, if Delish. you like something a little bit lighter, this is yes, it. Definitely. If you like it a little bit more oaky, yeah. this is it. And the other course. two are fabulous. Uh, they're all from... fabulous, and you can get gift packs as well yeah. from the Nude, the wine, nude company. wine Company. Michelle. Always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Coming up next, something a little bit different. Pour a bit of wine on it. It'll be fine. We're <laughs> in the country's uh, <laughs> cures. Like how dock leaves have more healing powers than just soothing nettle stings. We're going to see you after this quick break. You're very welcome back. So, well, if you are from rural Ireland, or I would say anywhere yeah. in Ireland, then chances are you have come across someone who has a cure for common ailments. Absolutely, our next guest. And not guest. the doctor. No, no, absolutely not. Sure, many not. of you have come across <laughs> the doctor. Like, I well, hope so. It's hard to get an cure. appointment. Though. Our next guest has been extensively studying Irish folk cures and has a brand new book about it. Please welcome author Cecily Gilligan. Hello, Thank Cecily. You very much, How are you? Thank Cecily. you, Tommy. Lovely I Tommy. think most of us, certainly with my grandmother, it was always, I know, go down there now and they'll sort you out and they'll sort you out and this will do another thing. How did you get interested in the area of cures and kind of mystical cures and things that have been handed down through the ages. Okay, so I've been interested in childhood. I grew up in rural County Sligo on a farm in County Sligo and the cures were just part of community life and everybody availed them, you know, now and then, whenever you needed them. And as a child, I had a cure for jaundice. It was a herbal bottle. And then I had ringworm. You pick it up from the cattle. Yes. And I was cured by the local Seven Sun. So the were cures were part of the community. And then uh, it was when I was in university in Cork, uh, I did a, a dissertation. I did research into the old cures and I talked to people who had the cures and then it was about 20 years later in 2005 I came back to it it was a good piece of research and my supervisor had said potentially it was a book mm. so I said I better get on with that book and I came back to it in 2005 and I started interviewing people again and in total I, I spent five years researching uh, doing the interviewing I interviewed over 90 people who have cures around Ireland all around Ireland yeah. for faith and for herbal I, because yeah you spoke to 93 you've got the book it's called cures of Ireland if anybody wants to look at it as well were, were they were they willing to open up about how the cure comes about and and even like faith cures because it's more mental side of it that yeah they were well, I it? mean basically you know I was always very respectful of people and most people have a secret they're quite private about the cures yeah. but it's passed around generally by word of mouth so uh, but no you, you, I went and I talked to people and then they would say and if they had a secret they kept their secret and that was fine mm. but often people were interested because not many people would speak to them about the cures so they're quite happy to have an opportunity to talk about it and you mentioned there the local seventh son. And yes. uh, I've gone to a seventh daughter before. So can you explain what that is? Yeah, so in Ireland, we have the tradition of seventh daughters and seven sons. And basically, it's uh, in the past when we had very large families. So if you had seven boys or seven girls born consecutively, now you couldn't have three girls and a boy and then four girls. You had to have them uh, born consecutively, one after the other. And the seventh child was believed to have a cure. And the cure is usually for ringworm. Sometimes they might also cure warts uh, or the skin problems and some people have gone on to become quite uh, well-known faith healers and one of the interesting things about the tradition um, the seven son tradition seven daughter tradition is the worm yeah so basically when the child is born lots of people would have told me this I, I think I spoke to nine seven sons and daughters in the end they would said when I was a baby in the hospital or in the nursing home they put the worm on my hand and the worm will die very quickly like within about three minutes so and it's kind of 
then they know, yeah. then they know the child has the gift. And still today, if they put a worm in their hand, that will yeah, happen. Because right. that's dying out, of course, because you don't have such big families yes. anymore. And the other six children going, what about me? I, I know, can't, I don't have the power to kill a worm. <laughs> hey, what about herbal cures? Because you have a number of different... Yes. Uh, yeah. Plants here, yes. nettles and and uh, and dock leaves and everything yes. else. Uh, so, yes, Tommy, so, yeah, we would have <coughs> had a huge amount of herbal lore and herbal cures in Ireland, but unfortunately we have managed to, we've managed to lose a lot of it. Okay. So hopefully we can try and reclaim some. But uh, some obvious ones, like I have there just beside you, they're hawberries from yes. the, haw the hawthorn tree, the beautiful tree, the beautiful white blossoms in May. Mm -hmm. That's a traditional cure for hearts. So people would have used that. Uh, you can use the berries and the leaves and the... Um, the flowers from it, and you can make a herbal uh, a tea with it, and that's a heart cure. And that's can you do that yourself now, or you kind of need to s go to somebody? Well, and... I think the heart is obviously a, a very important organ in the body, so uh, you could do some little research on it. But I would recommend you going to a herbalist, okay. and I would say the same for all the all the cures. You know, obviously modern medicine is wonderful, mm -hmm. and we love our doctors. So you know, please use your your yeah. modern medicine. But I think there's a place for the traditional cures, and they have survived. Yeah. So there's a place for the for that traditional cures within our society. Well, let's talk about dock leaves because I think every single one of us yes. as a child goes screaming through a field, go give me a dock leaf uh -huh. when you get a nettle. And yeah. it works. So yes. but there, it, the dock leaf can do more. Yeah, so that's the dock leaf. I am over there beside the nettle. Over so there, when yeah. you get stung traditionally, you give it a good rub on your nettle sting and uh, the children would always have a little, a little song to go with it, maybe dock and dock and cure my nettle, something like that. But also it would have been used, yeah, for other maybe skin, uh, other maybe insect bites. Um, and also I, I think it was, understand it was used to stop uh, blood, uh, blood flow. And also in the old days when people made butter, handmade churned butter, they wrapped the butter in dock leaves. So obviously help with some kind of a preservative or help to keep the butter fresh. Yeah. Hey, we, like, I have to go back to some of the text messages because we have been talking about this through the show as well. And we were talking to somebody about... Don't be licking her finger now, having, stop it. They, I go and see a healer who, if you burnt your hands, they'd like put saliva or they'd lick or whatever yes. else your hands. Yeah. Is that one that would be well known yeah, as well? Yeah, that's quite well known. And I talked to a number of people who have that cure, the cure of the burn, it's called. And basically, uh, we have a little creature in Ireland called a man keeper, which is a smooth newt, a newt. Uh, so it's like a little lizardy creature. And you find them in rural Ireland, I find them in my garden. Okay. And uh, the idea is that you, you, you grab that little fellow and you give it a good lick. I know it sounds strange. Lick, lick it, especially on a, you lick the newt. And once you've licked the newt, or the man keeper is the, what we traditionally call it, then you have the cure, the burn. So then if you burn your hand or something, you just would lick your hand. Um, and people have told me, yeah, this works very effective. And when um, when people come when people come to you with the burn, they, they lick it and they say the pain will disappear very quickly and the healing process will start. Uh, and and it's called a man keeper. If a you lick it, do you keeper. get to keep a man as well? Do you? Uh, <laughs> Possibly. Not if he catches you licking the news. Uh, <laughs> and what about warts with snails? Is that another one? Uh, that's that would yeah, that's with snails. There's a lot of cures, and sometimes then they say, um, yeah, you can rub the snail on it, and that's the cure. But there's loads of cures for warts um, like for example uh, the potato you get a potato you rub it on and then you would uh, bury the potato it's very important to get rid of the potato bury it and it's kind of based on the belief of transference when you when you put it into the earth and it rots away your warts will go with it are there are there reasons like the the reasons behind the cures and the belief in them and the science of it in the uh, I don't I don't delve into that too much <laughs> no. no I've just gone out and talked to lots of people and documenting the tradition and taking you know taking them at good faith. Of what was an oral uh, history. And yes, it's it is. It's very really it. strong, yes. It's a history yes. of Ireland as well. It's called Cures of Ireland, a treasury of Irish folk remedies. And my God, does everyone have at least one? Fascinating. <laughs> exactly. And listen, the amount of people who text in said, don't knock them, because these, so many people have had so much success from it as well. Cessie. Uh, we love them. We have ours so here every morning. They're called <laughs> thank plastic you so much. flowers. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you, Cessie. Thank Pleasure you for me Best of luck with the book thank as well. Coming up on tomorrow's show he had a memorable double act with uh, Matt Hancock on I'm a Celeb we're going to talk to comedian Sean Walsh so you meet the TikTok star known for reviewing spice bags and make it, taking the mick out of Irish towns Garen Noon will be here and there's uh, Winter Willies on the catwalk and Hake in the kitchen Ireland AM is live from 7 have a great weekend we'll Bye. see you on Monday yeah.